Hello, I'm Neil Milliken. I'm a white, late middle-aged male with mousy hair, brown square glasses and a slight stubble. Uh, and I'm wearing a, uh, a blue uh, polo shirt. Um, I'm head of accessibility at Atos, a, uh, a systems integrator. So that's about me. But I'm more excited to talk about the people on the panel today. Uh, this, this panel is about a greater purpose and developing a diverse talent pipeline. So in all areas of technology development, it's really important for us to be inclusive and make sure that the teams that are building platform technologies, applications and developing the content are diverse. Of course, this includes people with disabilities, as well as people from different racial, ethnic, gender, sexual, cultural, religious and socio-economic backgrounds. And today we have a wonderful combination of perspectives that we wish to share with you from our panelists. And I'm going to ask them briefly to introduce themselves and their areas of focus, particularly in regards to building XR experiences for everyone. Let's start with Nina Solomons, founder of the XR Diversity Initiative. Hello, hi, this is Nina speaking. Um, I am an Asian, uh, I would say now middle-aged <laughs> woman, uh, and I'm wearing a blue shirt with uh, a bookcase in the background. And um, I work and lead the XR Diversity Initiative in the UK. Excellent. Um, and, and can you tell me a little bit about the purpose of the XR Diversity Initiative? Oh, sorry. I thought we were going, we were going to go all around. Uh, uh, yeah, sure. no, we've we'll, got we'll <laughs> a little bit. Um, uh, sure. I can, I can give you a description. So the XR Diversity Initiative uh, is an uh, initiative that is not for profit. Uh, we organize workshops which are face-to-face -face where um, you can meet industry professionals and you can learn XR skills without having any background in coding or filmmaking. And the whole idea is to give individuals from underrepresented groups the confidence to pursue a career in XR or integrate XR into their business and um, continue to hopefully create a more diverse, fresh, and innovative space in uh, immersive technologies. Fantastic. Thank you, Nina. So, uh, moving on to you, Christopher. Um, so, you, you started the, the Black Technology Mentorship Program. Can you tell me about yourself and about it, please? Oh, uh, Neil, and first and foremost, I'm so happy to be here today with Verizon Media and Cornell Tech and Pete and all the wonderful things that you're doing and highlighting this very necessary discussion and subject matter in the ecosystem of XR technology. Uh, my name is Christopher Lafayette, a black American who finds himself here in Silicon Valley. Uh, today I'm rocking a purple shirt, which I hope it comes and looks like a purple shirt, or at least feels like a purple shirt in the translation of the viewing window that you're looking at. About a year ago, I launched an initiative with extreme vulnerability, frankly, called the Black Technology Mentorship Program. And I said that is because I stopped in my tracks of everything that I was doing. I've had a desire to be able to mentor people as I have been doing for years now, especially in the XR space. I stopped in my tracks and I looked and saw Ahmaud Arbery, Breonna Taylor, George Floyd, and other individuals and folks that look like me come from cities where I come from. And I had to ask myself, what am I doing? If not me, then who? So I launched an initiative called the Black Technology Mentorship Program, which is a mentee mentor program that inspires, educates, and brings underserved black communities and communities of color into technology. Because I've come to appreciate as of late that on the subject of XR, which stands for extended reality for those in the audience who may not know, that if we're going to extend reality, that we must bring reality with it. And on the subject of metaverses, you cannot have metaverses without meta people. And we will never be as great as we can be a technology until everyone has the opportunity to build it, no matter the color, no matter the gender. Technology will never be as great as it can be until we all have accessibility. And so I'm looking forward to sharing much and more of what we're working on at BTMP. 
Thank you very much. And uh, next, I'd like to introduce Andres Forsland of Cognition. Andres, can you tell us about yourself and your work? Uh, thanks, Neil. Uh, yeah, hi, my name is Andreas Forsland. I'm the founder and CEO of a technology startup called Cognition, C-O-G-N-I-X-I-O-N. Uh, you can find us online. Uh, so at Cognition, um, oh, a little bit about me. So I'm I'm a middle-aged guy, a white guy, live in California. Uh, uh, I'm from the South, from Atlanta. Uh, I've worked all over the world uh, with previous careers. Um, and I am currently uh, wearing a light blue uh, Hawaiian shirt um, to try and bring some sunshine here today uh, to Southern California. So, um, but uh, back to Cognition. Uh, so what we're building is a wearable uh, augmented reality headset. So it's an HMD uh, head mounted display that includes uh, EEG, that's a technology term for brain sensors. Uh, and so it's a headset that basically includes brain sensing capability. Uh, and so what this means is it's the first ever fully integrated uh, system that includes neurotechnology with augmented reality. Um, and we're building it as an accessible platform. So thinking about individuals with extremely wide uh, access needs, um, specifically uh, neurodiverse and individuals with say progressive disorders like ALS or uh, brainstem strokes or acquired disorders. Uh, uh, so we're working with individuals who have motor and speech disabilities. And we're building this technology uh, to augment someone's ability to communicate. So if you're familiar with someone who is unable to communicate orally, uh, this will enable them to have easier, faster, natural access to generate speech that can be understood by people uh, around them. Uh, and we're also designing it so that it has environmental smart home controls built in and eventually could be used as a mobility solution for driving uh, power wheelchairs and wayfinding in the real world. So we call it assisted reality as a new category of augmented reality, where we're trying to design really useful applications uh, for AR that can be controlled uh, via any kind of input, switch, head movement, uh, and brain control interface through focusing on objects and selecting things. So a little bit about us, though, is we've been working on this for about four years now. And uh, along the way, we realized that there is no way to design for others. We had to really adopt a philosophy of for us, by us. Uh, and so we co-design with individuals with a wide variety of disabilities uh, in the design process. And I'd be happy to talk more about that uh, on the panel uh, today. Jason, and it's really exciting. And I'm fascinated around the topics of both neurodiversity and the, the potential of uh, augmented reality to be an assistive technology. So. I'm super excited to have you here today. Uh, over to our fourth panelist, uh, and this is Josh Christensen of the Partnership on Inclusive Apprenticeships. Josh, you and I have talked and met before, but for the sake of the audience, can you share a bit about yourself and the work that your organization does, please? Sure, thank you, and very honored to be on this panel with the people doing such interesting and important work. My name is Josh Christensen. I'm a white male. I have a a dark gray checkered shirt on that matches my monochromatic gray hair I'm at my friend's house. And there's a picture of Frida Kahlo in the background. Um, but I am currently, I have a background in, in, in diversity and inclusion uh, and around kind of workforce development, but, but mostly um, in the areas of race, ethnicity, socioeconomic. Uh, in my past life, for the last seven years, I've been focused on disability and accessibility in the workplace and have been uh, working on various projects um, out of the de U.S. Department of Labor, uh, funded by the Office of Disability Employment Policy. So I used uh, many years until about a year ago with Pete, one of the co-sponsors of this, um, and glad to stay connected with that. But my current role is Project Director of the Partnership on Inclusive Apprenticeship, and or PIA. And PIA is really set up, designed to support build, bolster, promote, whatever we can do uh, about creating inclusive apprenticeship 
in high growth, high demand. So um, apprenticeship is this growing field. We're focused on um, sectors that are the future of work. So we have a, a really, uh, you know, our sweet spot is the IT sector. We also do work and have a focus on clean energy, finance, healthcare, other high growth, high demand sectors um, defined by Department of Labor. But even within those, we're, we're often looking at technology and how it's utilized within those sectors. And, you know, there's a growing future. We, we all are here. We know this, especially related to XR, that is going to be the employment landscape, the participation landscape. And PIA is really designed to make sure that people with disabilities are a part of that. And so that apprenticeship program, uh, which I can speak specifically to more later, are designed in a way that can be inclusive of people with disabilities so they can take advantage of those career growth opportunities. Uh, we do have a, a focus on people with disabilities, and specifically, I think, to XR access and the concept of inclusive design. We know that the more people with disabilities are involved in the development and design of technologies, uh, the more they will be inclusive, uh, which makes sense and is kind of our, our starting point, really, with Pete and Pia and, and all of this work. Um, but honestly, the more I learn uh, about apprenticeship, also, there are many other uh, demographics, uh, traditionally marginalized populations um, that are target groups for apprenticeship. And I think it's a fantastic tool um, to engage people that have oftentimes been excluded um, from the workplace, especially cutting edge workplace. And so if nothing else happens today, please learn about apprenticeship and how it might uh, bolster workforce development in your sector. Excellent, and and I'm also passionate about apprenticeships, having uh, worked on some on, on this side of the pond. So fascinating blend of backgrounds here. So uh, as we've heard throughout today, uh, our community is stressing the importance of co-design uh, and co-developing X4 XR platform technologies, applications, and content with diverse people, and not for them. And and of course, you know, we're taking into account intersectionality because actually we're not one. We're not one trait; we're many, uh, and and particularly that around disability, it's the most intersectional of all minority groups. Um, so, could each of you share some examples of how teams have directly your teams and have been directly involved people with disabilities or other marginalised or underrepresented groups in XR design and development? And maybe Christopher, you'd like to start. Sure, of course. Thanks, Neil. Uh, this is Chris. Lafayette again speaking. Um, with the Black Technology Mentorship Program, we're beginning to inspire people and whole company platforms to think differently on what exactly mentorship is and how it actually most effectively impacts change today in technology. And I would say that perhaps the single biggest thirst that we have for social impact programs is the lack of mentorship, guidance, and servant leadership. You know, I think one of the consistent themes that I've been hearing today at this wonderful conference with all the speakers that have been here is how do we go about actually getting more accessibility built into content development? Well, here's what you're not going to do. You're not going to force developers to say that you need to make your content X, Y, Z and make it inclusive for all people. That's just not going to happen. We can inspire people to go and take those initiatives and to drive forward. But I think if we go a little bit further to consider what would be best to do is to actually hire the people that we want to buy our products. And if it's being built by communities of color, and look, ecosystems are not hardware and software, ecosystems are people. And when you bring somebody that looks like me into your ecosystem, it's not an affirmative action initiative. When you bring someone that looks like me into your ecosystem, I level up the entire ecosystem. And so what we put a focus on with the Black Technology Mentorship Program is two specific tracks. How do we take career talent people that come from HBCUs, that come from general standard universities elsewhere, and get them what they need to level up to be force multipliers and complete contributors to product delivery teams and companies such as Verizon or Oculus or others, and how do we get them to contribute on day one to be the best that they can be and through post 
modern mentorship development to stay with them when they go and enter into these platforms. We already know that they're up against implicit and explicit bias. We know that. And I cannot go change the hearts and minds of every hiring manager in the world. So what we have to do is we're taking our talent and unlocking their minds and giving them what they need, equipping them to be able to mitigate implicit and explicit biases that they're up against. Look, I began this platform as a kid that's come to Silicon Valley with black colored skin, living out of my car out of Sunnyvale, Mountain View, and other places because I desperately, really, truly wanted to be in technology. I created this platform years later, and it wasn't just me. It was a lot of the people that helped teach me, women and men alike, technology osmosis by way off the land that helped teach me and when i launched this platform to said this isn't going to be a black exclusive initiative that i do not believe that it takes one community to lift itself out of a given situation but i believe that it takes all communities from all cultural backgrounds to help all communities lift itself up as a whole and so we have a makeup of folks from pixar designers to Apple engineers and XR to engineers that work for Oculus and elsewhere that make up the body of the Black Technology Mentorship Program. And in one year's time, in one year's time, we now have representation from 27 different countries, over 171 cities worldwide and six continents. But here's the kicker, Neil. Here's the kicker. We were able to build this whole entire initiative this one year with over now a thousand people in our system ecosystem, no brick and mortar buildings, and we didn't raise a single dime of any kind of capital at all to do this. This is all from the heart, yeah. hardworking people, 31 people internally that are with us, Neil. Yeah, no, so I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm fully on board with this because uh, I fully believe in mentorship. So, uh, Nina, um, please, can you tell us a bit more about XRD? Sure. I, I, I'm kind of on the same lines with Chris. Uh, I, I came from the filmmaking background, and I, I also had a gaming channel, and I experienced an incredible amount of hatred towards me simply because of me being a woman, I think my background, the way I looked, uh, the way I spoke, and it it was incredibly disheartening to go to a location and feel like whatever I brought to the table was not valuable and no one was interested in listening to what I had to say, the stories I wanted to tell, and that was a, a really difficult time period and I realized that the the only way to move forward is to create and, and, and shift that mentality. And I realize that the biggest problem that exists right now in XR is that there are a lack of individuals from underrepresented groups who have the right skill set to enter the industry. And I thought, okay, well, what can I do? What, what can I offer? Um, and similar to Chris, this is something that I've been doing since uh, back in 2018. I set up the Women in VR meetup group back in London, and I did all of this in my free time because I am so passionate and so driven to create a safe space where people can be fe can feel heard, can be seen, can get the support that they want because I don't want them to go through the same experience that I went through. I want them to feel safe. I want them to get support. I want them to ask for help. I want them to figure out how they can tell their stories and bring in a new perspective that I believe the community at that time potentially wouldn't have uh, that viewpoint because they weren't thinking outside of the box. So yeah. we created a system where it's only underrepresented groups. So LGBTQ, African, Asian, ethnic minority, individuals with disabilities, women, lower income background. If you are any of these, you can attend. And the workshops that we created were 360 Film, Unity, 360 Audio, Immersive Storytelling, Movement, Interaction Design, 3D Printing. And what was so incredible is that a large number, over 50% of the individuals who attended were women. And most of them were over 50. So a lot of them had ended, I suppose, their career and they were looking for a switch. They, they were looking to learn new skills. And some of the feedback I'd like to share is, I've never felt like I belonged in tech. But there are people here like me, and I feel like I belong in this community, and I do bring value. 
or this is an inclusive and fun way of learning every single different aspect of VR. And can we make this into a three to five day program? What we usually do is we do half the day is theory and the other half of the day is practical. So uh, we, we kind of offer a little bit of both. And over 76% uh, six, of every attendee is confident after attending XRDI to pursue a career in immersive tech. So I think that really showcases how if you come from that background, you can gain the confidence. You don't need to have coding skills. All you need is a little bit of help, a little bit of confidence. And that's something that we offer is a foot through the door to make you feel like actually this isn't so difficult. It's actually quite easy. I now know the people I've got access or I understand how the hardware works. And now I can figure out how to actually make a film or uh, create a company. And a lot of individuals after attending have done that successfully. And, and, and I'd, I'd like, that's fantastic. And I'd like some others to jump in here. So Andreas, you've, what are some of the ways that you've engaged people with disabilities in, in your development? Um, well, thanks for asking that question. You know, I think, uh, you, you know, accessibility and inclusion has been a topic for a long time and it's always sort of gotten lip service. Um, it sort of lived in HR and in compliance, but I think to the point that 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 Christopher, oh sorry, Andreas wasn't speaking. Um, you know, uh, the points that, that Christopher and Nina are making are are you know so true that we're at this impl inflection point that companies need to stop talking about it and start doing it. You know, uh, you have to walk the talk and actually build it into your cascading KPIs, your key performance indicators, and your metrics uh, that you hold uh, departments accountable for within companies. So uh, one example is Apple. You know, Apple, uh, they just announced that they're going to be putting part of the executive team's uh, bonuses on the line uh, uh, tied to accessibility initiatives, right? So as you start to add more teeth into, uh, into the organization, and more conviction uh, for a diverse uh, culture, uh, you're gonna start to see much more transformation, which I'm excited about this topic uh, in particular. What we're doing at Cognition um, is that from the very beginning, uh, we have co-designed and hired individuals with disabilities or have family members with disabilities uh, into the team. Uh, so our company currently is about 16 people, but what we've done is we've built uh, an advisory council around our team uh, of over 120 uh, people with disabilities. So we have almost 10X more people uh, in the community that we're working with than we have staff in the company. So we have individuals in our development team who have physical disabilities or represent neuro or gender diverse uh, profiles. We uh, uh, are heavily influenced by having a, a fairly balanced uh, a ratio uh, in our hiring practices. So as one example, 66% uh, of our engineers are female uh, and we intend to, to continue to have a diverse hiring strategy uh, within the organization. Um, beyond those that, are, the work are... we're doing it. Hmm? Sorry, Josh, we're, I'm, uh, we're, we're running a little behind time. So, but those are great examples. Um, so, yeah, um, yeah, and, and our point is just like walk the talk and, and don't just put lip service to it. Uh, as an ESG, you want to make a, a sustainable impact and uh, you have to put it into practice, I think is the point. Sorry, so, sorry, Neil again, and sorry, Andreas, for calling you. Josh, Josh, over to you. Thank you. Um, well, uh, you know, I wish Neil wasn't just the moderator, but a panelist, and you could talk about apprenticeships in accessible technology that you've been successful in utilizing over in the UK, I would say part of my goal in getting uh, people with disabilities involved in emerging technology would, or not part of my, one goal would be to have an accessibility occupation under the registered apprenticeship rubric of Department of Labor. And, and we're gonna keep working on that so that more people um, understand accessibility, and we would definitely uh, be targeting people with disabilities to participate. Uh, I also don't think there exists one specific to the XR world. This is not my uh, uh, strong point, so I hope I'm wrong. Someone can correct me, or I hope someone would t get in touch with me and I could help them uh, design and develop that. But, you know, we are working specifically around um, apprenticeships related technology and the skill sets that are utilized uh, 
um, by people that make emerging technologies. And so, um, and, and again, our focus is on making those inclusive from the, from the marketing, recruiting to all the protocol apprenticeships have a couple of components to them. They have related instruction that happens sometimes before the placement, there's a mentorship component then there's the job placement on the job training and just really infusing inclusion and awareness around disability um, through all of that is our goal. And so, you know, we work with um, various, what they're called intermediaries. So they might sit in between the talent and the uh, company, uh, plug Apprenti, ApprentiCareers.org. And you could go there and, you know, they're getting occupations from, you know, cloud specialist uh, operations, DevOps to basic, you know, programming uh, and, and, and developer. And so, you know, we're working hard to make sure they always work with a lot of uh, populations that people are speaking to, but they're also making huge efforts to include people with disabilities. And so that's exciting to see. And so I know we're short on time. So, you know, I would just close by saying it. I think apprenticeship just really is an amazing tool for any company uh, to utilize, whether you set it up by yourself or go through an intermediary. And anybody that's interested in that, I would encourage them to reach out to us at the Partnership on Inclusive Apprenticeship. Even if it's not specific to disability and other populations, I'd be happy to steer you in the right direction uh, to make the whole sector more inclusive and and, and welcoming of people. Uh, 100% echo that. It's it's Neil again. Um, Apprenticeships have been amazing for our organization. We've uh, benefited greatly. And, 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 And to echo some of the things that have been said by the panel so far, you know, we want to create organizations that create tech that are reflective of the makeup of society, because then we get tech that respects society and, and everything else. And apprenticeships are a great way uh, of getting th- that talent and and breaking down those pre um, those biases that people have, even if they're unconscious about how capable people are from different diverse groups. So. We could talk about this for hours, but but I, I think that um, it'd be really interested in um, looking at how the XR initiative uh, could leverage the approaches that you've outlined already to increase the involvement of people with disabilities and people from lots of different backgrounds. So perhaps Christopher, you could you could start. Sure. The best way that we're tackling that is that we don't want to do initiatives for communities, we want to bring these communities to do these initiatives. There's such a difference. There's such a difference when you're an organization that's doing something for people or you're doing things with people as the actual people, as someone that has come into this world. It's part of the disabled community. Someone that is coming to this world. Someone asked me a long time ago on stage years ago, Chris, when was the first time that you got into diversity, inclusion, and equity and belonging? And I had to think for a second and I said, I was born into it. Mm-hmm. I was born in this. I didn't just get this isn't just something for us to get into. This is how we are, who we live. And it's for far too long that there's been such a gap between companies and corporations that want to do for these communities. And I would submit to you that I have created a platform with 100%, just almost 100% female-led from C-Suite Down, women-led organization. And we've created an organization, a company that actually hires the people in whom we are looking to serve. And at the same time, getting relationships not from executive C-suite, but getting engineers that work at these companies or corporations and designers and artists and people from Unity and Unreal and all the rad things they're doing at Epic and getting them to be part of this. We just launched an initiative that's going viral right now called Her Innovation, which is a wonderful platform that's not just creating social initiative and social impact <clears throat> standards for female entrepreneurial development, but it's actually getting them with them on an honest and a real level. And that program was built by the women leadership that we have in our team. You know, I, for years, I've been hearing about how we could do so much better. And I've been taking notes how me as a man and as a black man can listen more to other communities that I could benefit from listening. And I have been one of those people that have benefited from listening. But here Here's the, here's the thing. All of us sitting here, we have wonderful ideas, wonderful ways to be able to contribute to our communities and execute. But many of us have these walls now 
that are so almost instrumental in saying, how do we pay for the right type of deal flow to be able to get the necessary capital to fuel these wonderful ideas that companies have so much solidarity for when it comes to our black communities and making their Instagram pages black and saying, we're with you and marketing opportunities. I'll believe it that you say that you're with me when I see people that look like me that are with you. And right now I extend an opportunity, Neil, I extend an opportunity. I'm not asking for a handout, but I extend an opportunity for companies such as Verizon Media, Cornell Tech, Pete, the wonderful work that Samantha Soloway is doing, the wonderful work that Bill Curtis Richardson is doing, and the wonderful work and to make these communities holistic and real by actually being a product of that experience and living it and not just talking about it. Again, I say we're heading into immersive simulated environments. Hyper-realistic, immersive, simulated environments when it comes to XR in ways that we Absolutely. have never seen. Uh, Chris, Christopher, I, I, I can feel your passion, but we're, we're, we're running over time. So Go ahead. Go ahead. I'm sorry. No, so, so, so sorry about this. We can talk for hours for sure. Um, Andreas, likewise, I, I know you're passionate. So um, how are we going to leverage this disability, uh, minority-led innovation um, through the initiatives that you're you're doing, uh, how can XR be the next thing that brings people together? Well, you know, I, I just echo again what Chris is saying. You know, it's it's designing for people and with people, but it's actually giving people the tools to design in your organization. So I think, you know, if you're going to be building systems on Unreal or you know, Unity or other platforms, uh, Niantic or others, um, you need to make sure that those environments have templated tools that take advantage of best practices for accessibility, right? So start at the platform development layer, give the tools and plugins to people who need to develop the tools for themselves and for their community, right? So let's start at the platform and the development environments. Make sure that they're accessible and that they have the tools to provide accessible features. Um, that can be deployed out universally. I think that's an area to start. And you know, training individuals on those tools uh, and then raising awareness for not only the goodwill uh, and the social reasoning and the passionate reasonings for an inclusive world, but there's also a, a point to be made uh, which has to do with kind of the cynical aspects of business, which has to do with real business. The economics of an inclusive world is there's an abundance of money. There's an abundance of gross domestic product that is just sitting on the sidelines waiting to be deployed through unlocking creativity of this extremely neurodiverse, uh, you know, community of billion. There's literally a billion people with disabilities and, you know, a large portion of individuals can't even get in to use the technology, but they have cognitive abilities and creative capability to express themselves in a variety of ways. And so I think let's start with tool building, with training, uh, and building best practices around things like low vision access, hearing access, uh, speech access, thinking about cognitive and behavioral uh, access tools, um, thinking about motor augmentation. Um, you know, and so those are areas that I think are super important. Uh, you know, and really thinking about right now this inflection point. I just did a keynote last week on you know, a hundred year view. So 50 years kind of looking backwards and 50 years looking forwards. And right now, 2020, we're at this inflection point where if you go back in time, accessible like indirect or alternative access methods has always been kind of the secondary way to access technology because it was always um, an interface that was dependent on using your hands to turn knobs or rabbit ears or move sliders or click buttons and things like this. We're moving into a realm where there's going to be more sensors than you've ever dreamed of on your mobile phones and your AR and mixed reality environments. So we're at this technological inflection point where we're going to get into like sensors as the user interface, which means it's the first time in history where if we design XR right, that we can take advantage of sensors to where people with, with diverse access needs become your power users first. So like the next 50 years are going to be around designing for accessibility and letting everyone else in the mainstream benefit from that. So think about taking a universal design approach. And the moment is now um, to see that sort of Mobius curve switch towards uh, a more sensorial based uh, experience.
That's super interesting. And 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 um, uh, last up, but not for, by no means least, Nina. You're on mute. First of all, I'd like to say that this is so inspiring and everything that XR Access is doing as well as what Andreas and Christopher and Josh are doing is so, so inspiring. Um, I really, really hope that XR Access can uh, work together with all the partners and potentially, I don't know, create a pipeline where it's, it's you know, teaching, educating, apprenticeship, and then maybe job. Um, running regular accessibility sprints for research and design with other companies, trying to figure out a way to pay developers to build plugins that are successful and, and benefit the community. Um, in terms of what XRDI is doing, uh, we've created a, a free resources sheet, which is available on our website. And if you uh, are looking to support um, diversity and uh, everything that XRDI is doing, please feel free to contact me if you're interested in a specific workshop. Also, feel free to contact me. Um, I really, really am very excited about everything that's being said today, and uh, I really look forward to seeing um, what everybody else will do in the future. Wonderful. Uh, this is Neil again. So I really want to thank Andreas, Christopher, Josh, and Nina for the valuable perspectives and your clear passion for this, right? I'm, I'm equally passionate, and clearly half an hour is not enough for us to cover all of these uh, amazing topics, but we we also owe the audience the opportunity to ask us some questions. So, um, so I, I would really, you know, uh, like to open up the the floor and hand over to to Jesse uh, for Q and A. Great, thank you so much, uh, Neil, Josh, Nina, Christopher, and Andreas for that fantastic discussion. It was really so inspiring to learn from all of you on this. Um, so for the audience, as a reminder, you can post questions to the panelists in the Topic Business channel on Slack. So I'm going to start with a question that combines uh, what Corinne and Bill asked, which is um, from Bill, uh, what does the K-12 and university student pipeline look like for Accessible XR? And for Corinne, how can we bridge the gap between, bridge the gap for students with disabilities entering the workforce? Um, because they sort of lose that student support as they graduate. Um, would anybody like to take this one? Sure, I'll take it. I could. So go ahead. Josh, do you want to do you want to go? So we and to answer to, and I think those are fantastic questions. You know, and I'll keep it brief. We've become more virtual in the past year than we have the past ten. And we now are using communication tools that have been available to us, but in ways that we've never had before. Within our Black Technology Mentorship Program, we have 250 educational modules that we're building. We're building 250 more by year's end to reach out to our specific K through 10 and K through 12 community members, because it's so important to make sure that they understand where it is that they're heading into this new virtual world. I mean, can you imagine being in K through 12 heading into this pandemic world that we're heading in, that they're heading into? I mean, there was a time where we were all coming out into the workforce, into this new world in such a different way, but it's completely converting virtual. And this is why I continue to say that we cannot let just curriculum and education be their guide. It takes mentorship reimagine to help get our younger generations and communities into this new world that we're now find ourselves in. Thank you, Christopher. I mean, I'd, I'd like to echo the, this is Neil again, I, I'd like to echo the fact that I think that traditional education is just unfit for the world that we're now living in and that we need a technology immersive and inclusive uh, approach to helping people learn and acquire knowledge um, in a way that that meets their needs, their needs and the employer's needs, so they have the right skills to meet the jobs of tomorrow, and the capabilities to continue that learning. Because actually, one of the things that's really changed over the last period of time is the requirement to constantly learn and constantly reacquire new tech skills. 
And the education system hasn't been capable of delivering that. And we have an opportunity to broaden the opportunities for everyone by creating new ways of teaching. Great, thank you. Um, so in the interest of time, I'm going to combine another two questions. So Miles on Slack asks, do any of the panelists have experiences that they'd like to share regarding the intersectionality of disability with race or gender? Um, and building on that with Dylan's question, um, to what extent do you think that creating these opportunities and creating accessible technologies is an issue of social justice? So I'm gonna hand this one to Neil and maybe you can address it or assign call on someone else. Sure. Well, well well, I only, I, I'm not intersectional. I, I do have hidden disabilities and I am absolutely passionate about it being a social justice issue. Um, maybe some of the other panelists can talk about intersectionality better than I can because I'm at the intersection of disability and white male privilege. Go on, you, 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 go on. You, you look like you're ready to, to say something, so please. Well, yes. you know, this, this, it, it, it's, a, it's a thorny topic, right? And it's kind yeah. of like, it's a bold statement to say anything is a human right. You know, I mean, it, yeah. it takes some sort of, you know, com, you know, the commons come together to define and turn something mm -hmm. from an idea into fact because yeah. everyone agrees to it, right? But in our case at Cognition, this is Andrea speaking, um, at Cognition, we're focused on supporting individuals who have trouble communicating, right? Um, and for us, that is a bold statement that we believe that communication is in fact a human right. It's a part of the human condition and it's everything. Everything in life is dependent on expressing yourself and being understood. So fundamentally, we believe that social justice is, and communication is intertwined and communication access has to be prioritized. And, and we're starting to see areas where you're talking about this intersection and, and, and some of the intersections we see, which are, you know, economic position. So we have individuals who are um, economically uh, vulnerable, uh, socioeconomically vulnerable uh, because of a disability. Um, need to have methods of funding access to technology. So we're benefiting from the work that has changed, like policy has changed due to a number of influential factors that has led to laws being created where Medicare and Medicaid and, and private insurance now covers the cost of speech generating devices um, and other things like this. So as we start to see, um, we just have to really be mindful of the out-of-pocket expense uh, and the overhead of assistive technologies and accessible technologies. And so the more the platform companies that yield tremendous international power take seriously accessibility to where they can invest and scale out access to billions of people, as opposed to putting the dependencies on medical insurance funding and the public sector to pay out of taxes to pay for that, where the, the digital platforms should be focusing much more and taking it seriously, I think. Um, uh, and the in economic uh, uh, checks and balances that are associated with that. And, and it's not just individuals with communication disabilities. I mean, across the board, we also have seniors, right? So we have a huge uh, a trend that's, that's emerging now um, that's having to do all the way back to the baby boomers um, but we're having lower and lower um, birth rates. Uh, and so we have this aging population with a vacuum behind the aging population called the sandwich generation that's gonna be impacted for caregiving. And so you have this caregiving um, tsunami that's about to hit over the next 10 to 20 years, coupled with a lack of technology that's really in place to help empower caregivers mm -hmm. and teachers and uh, clinical professionals um, whether you're old uh, and or or you have a disability at a young age or an old age, um, so I think it's a call to action right now where we really need to think about the future, the accessible world, uh, and then how we can actually push um, more of the funding and the economics out of government and into um, industry uh, to help subsidize uh, and invest in those innovations. 
Yeah, Neil, I, I think when we talk about intersectionality, I think about Kimberly Crenshaw and how uh, most people really don't understand the magnitude of what that actual term means. I really enjoyed what Andreas just said, and I'll just say this uh, in my closing words, uh, if you will, is that, look, here's the situation. If we had more equity, inclusion, belonging, and sustainability incorporated into XR technology, which we desperately, desperately need, I would submit to you, and you have companies that are willing and wanting to do more, someone even mentioned Apple, I know that some people say, well, Apple's valued as a $2 trillion company. Aren't they doing well or fine? And I would submit to you this, that I believe that Apple, who I love, would be valued as an $8 to $10 trillion company had they embraced this type of initiative when it comes to social justice. This is a social justice issue, and we have to stop looking at this as a feel-good initiative. But these initiatives are revenue drivers, and if you do not have this type of material woven into the fabric of your ecosystem, our foundations will fail. So it's not a feel good initiative. No, it is a foundational development and a necessity that we hire people with accessible demand and need and inclusion. It's a must. We cannot succeed unless we do that. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we've got the tsunami of aging and, and acquired disabilities. We must make sure that the, the, the people we employ and that we keep and employed and we keep economically viable and, 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 and engaged represents the whole of society, not just subsets. I, I don't know how we are for time. Are, are we all right? Did, did, did Nina want to comment or will we have to close now? Unfortunately, we are out of time. Um, thank you so much, all of you, Neil, Josh, Nina, Christopher, Andreas. Um, it's been so great to learn from all of you on this. I am going to pass it off now to Dylan to wrap, it up, wrap up our event for the day. Thank you.